You're listening to episode number 13 of the Addiction Support Podcast. Hi, Oak Creek Wellness family. Welcome to Addiction Support Podcast, where I talk with inspiring people who share their knowledge and experience of addiction and what's working for them. This is addiction support for family and friends from people who've been there. I'm your host, Melissa Sue Tucker. Hi guys, welcome back to the Addiction Support Podcast. If this is your first time, well, I'm really glad that you're here. And if not, I think that you guys, um, for anybody that's listened to me in the past, you've heard me talk about the anonymous people and facing addiction. Um, Alicia Cook and I mentioned it, and there's been other episodes where I've mentioned it. So this week, I am grateful and honored to have been able to interview and speak with one of the co-founders of Facing Addiction, Terry M. Rubenstein. Terry was an executive vice president of the Joseph and Harvey Mayerhoff Family Charitable Funds from 1998 until her retirement at the end of 2011. Her current board activities include secretary and founding member of Facing Addiction and secretary of the Baltimore Symphony Endowment Trust. Prior activities include secretary of the Hazelden Betty Ford Foundation, founder and board member of Repair the World, president of IEF, and board member of JAFI, JDC, and Matten in Israel. She was also chairman of the Baltimore County Chamber of Commerce, secretary of the board of St. Mary's College and creator of the Center of Democracy at the college. Terry graduated from Emerson College in 1970 and received honorary degrees from Ben Gurion University and St. Mary's College. She was a home builder and developer for most of her career prior to the foundation position. Prior to that, she was a newspaper and radio reporter. She lives in Baltimore with her husband, Jim, and has three children and four grandchildren. This woman is doing her part to change the, well, the face of addiction. And you'll hear her talk about how their goal for facing addiction, their mission is to basically take it in and, you know, how they have the American Cancer Society. Well, basically they want to be that for addiction in the United States and they're doing a lot of good things and they need our support to keep going and to grow with it. So I hope that you enjoy the episode. Before we get started, you know, I'm always asking for reviews on iTunes and for you to subscribe because that's how more people are going to find us. So this week, I just want to thank Hypnotic Woman. She says, wonderful addiction recovery support. This addiction support or this addiction podcast is just the right resource for anyone who is dealing with addiction at any level. We all know or have known people who have addiction or have been addicted ourselves to something or someone. Anyone can use support, and Melissa provides us with great tool to help those who are still in the struggle. Her stories are heartfelt, touching, and inspiring. You will definitely be moved in a positive way. Keep up the great work you are bringing to the world, Melissa. So I just want to thank you for that amazing review and everyone else who has left a review. And if you haven't yet, please stop by iTunes and leave us a review. If you're not sure how to do that, I have a page dedicated to that on addictionsupportpodcast.com. And if you want the show notes for this week's episode, it's addictionsupportpodcast.com forward slash episode 13. Or you can just go, if you're listening to it the week that it's released, addictionsupportpodcast.com and uh, Terry's episode will show up at the top. So I want to thank you. Love you guys as always. See you surrounded with light and love. Please enjoy this episode. Terry, thank you so much for being on the Addiction Support Podcast today. I really appreciate your time. I'm I'm pleased to join you. I was hoping that you could, um, I know it can be raw and vulnerable, but can you share how addiction has initially how it impacts your life? Sure. Um, I have three children and four grandchildren. So um, my youngest child, who is now 33, was about 17 or so when we realized that he was that he was having trouble. And we really didn't know exactly what the trouble was. Um, he had been a... a, a um, a kid with some learning issues, but always a terrific kid and never did anything terrible and um, good athlete, very, very charming. Um, and we knew he was experimenting with marijuana and we knew that. And so we didn't really pay much attention to it. 
until um, he was a, he went he took a year off between high school and college because we didn't think he was really ready. And um, the following year, he went to college, and he his life sort of started to come apart. And uh, once that once we really understood that, um, we realized we had to take some action. He'd had a bunch of little, two or three petty things. You know, he'd been arrested once with other kids in this in a car, and they they had to. He did. He spent one night in jail. I mean, nothing like any of my my not, other kids never had any issues at all. And so, these were all sort of strange little isolated things that happened. And we began to realize that um, there was a pattern, and that we had to we had to do some more investigating. And so um, we. Charlie Charlie went to Jazz Fest, and uh, while he was there, he he lost his license, and he ended up in jail. And um, he called me. And I, we had him spend a couple nights in jail. And some one of, we had a friend down in New Orleans who was able to go and get him. But that's when we realized that the time had come that we had to do some kind of an intervention in our family. There were just too many. Too many things. They were, you know, it was never horrific, and and it was just stupid stuff. Um, but one of the things about my son was that when you have children, if you tell them not to touch the stove, you tell them once. Maybe they'll try it again, <laughs> and then, but the third or fourth time, then you know something's not right. And so. Um, we brought Charlie. I went down to to New Orleans to get him because he couldn't, you know, had no identification. So I had to go down with his birth certificate, get pick him up, take him to the airport, etc. And then, and then my children and I uh, did an intervention with him and um, and my husband, and we we told him that he had to go into a hospital. We needed to have a real diagnosis of what was going on. And we did, and um, and he accepted it, fortunately. Um, but we had really told him that, um, you know, I've skipped over. There were lots of little minor incidents, but there were enough incidents that we were really starting to become very concerned about his ability to, to function. Hmm. And so we did the invention. He went into the hospital. He was... Um, he was treated, and uh, they discovered that he had an underlying mental issue, which we had never really known, and they started treating him for that, and that was very successful. But in the meantime, he was an addict. I mean, there was no question now that he was addicted to marijuana and alcohol, mm -hmm. and it makes me... Um, very angry when people say, oh, you can't be addicted to marijuana. You absolutely can. And there are lots of kids that he went through treatment with that were addicted to marijuana. Um, so it is not harmless and it is not nothing any more than alcohol is harmless and not nothing. Hey. You know, people become generally those are the places that they start with alcohol and marijuana. And, um, they are both addictive, and um, people need to understand that. And that doesn't mean everybody will be an addict, obviously. I have other children and other family members who, and myself, I mean, if I have one drink, I'm like done. Right. <laughs> you know? So uh, everybody's capacities are different. Everybody's brain chemistry is different. People are structured very, very differently. So Charlie was... Um, fortunate enough to get into Hazelden, Minnesota. We were able to send him there, and he began his journey there when he was about 19 years old. He was in inpatient treatment for 30 days, and then he was in extended treatment for another 90 days. Then he went to a halfway house that they ran for another three or four months, and then he moved into sober housing with some other friends. And he stayed in the St. Paul, Minnesota area for almost seven years, which really was 
an enormous boost for him because he was in a, had numbers of sober friends and it was able to construct a new life with sober friends which is terribly important for adolescents so was he was that a different state than what he was originally living in oh yeah okay. yeah we're from yeah we're from maryland okay and um one of the things that people need to understand is that when you're dealing with a child who is addicted, people think, oh, I'll send him to treatment or I'll send her to treatment and she'll get well. Well, treatment is, is it has to be a continuum. It has to be a long process. Children don't get addicted in five minutes and they don't get unaddicted in 30 days. It just isn't realistic. That's, that's a health insurance uh, regimen. It's not, it's certainly not based on medical science and medical science has ear is absolutely crystal clear that the longer a person is in treatment, the better his or her chances are of recovery. And that's just a fact. And one of the things that I think parents need to understand is that the road to recovery takes time. You have to have a lot of patience and a lot of love and understand that your child has a disease. These are brain diseases. These are things that nobody chooses. People don't wake up in the morning and say, gee, I think I'll be an addict. It just doesn't work that way. No. And, and so it's, it's complicated. You know, parents become very angry. They become very defensive. I mean, all the things that have happened as a result of the child's addiction can be really infuriating and uh, very, very upsetting and, and harmful to the rest of the family. And uh, that's, that is a huge issue. So I think, first and foremost, parents and siblings need to understand the road to recovery takes time, takes a lot of time and don't give up. You just can't give up on your, your loved one because it's a process. You know, when, when, when our son went into treatment, we used to fly out to Minnesota every month to visit him. Wow. And, uh, that was terribly important for him and terribly important for us, but he was still not, the boy we knew when he was 13 years old for months and months and months. It took a long time. It takes a long time to detox. It takes a time, long time for people to get straight in their own heads. I mean, there, he was in a pretty therapeutic environment. So that was extraordinarily helpful. And, um, many kids start down this path around self-esteem issues. Um, and no matter, this was a very good looking, very attractive boy, very good athlete, but he had issues uh, that he had not come to terms with as a child. And I think that contributed. And, and when I see so many of the other kids that he went through treatment with, um, they're, they have that in common. Hmm. Well, I'm glad that your son's alive and well today. Um, and that you guys were able to get him the help that he needed. Did he fight you at all when you guys sat down and wanted him to go when you had the intervention or was no. he open to the help? No, he didn't. He didn't. I think he realized that he needed help at that point and that, um, that, that things, he did not fight us at all. And, and, and you know, we were lucky. Um, he, he didn't like what was happening and, and he didn't like what was going on in his head. And so I think he was relieved actually that uh, we were able to come up with a strategy to help him. What advice do you have for family members that might be thinking about or have been playing with the idea of having an inter intervention, but they're just afraid of how their loved one might take it? Well, I think, first of all, I would encourage any family to do it. 
I we did not use a professional interventionist. We um, we're all pretty educated people. We sat down prior to the meeting and determined what we were going to say and and tell tell him how we felt and what we were concerned about. Um, I think I think anybody who has a loved one that they're worried about absolutely should do an intervention. And it doesn't necessarily mean it'll work the first time, but mm. you can't give up. You got to do it again. Um, and we were lucky, and our son and, and our family structure was healthy. You know, he had he had loving siblings, loving parents, and um, we were. It was a healthy dynamic. Um, so I think we had some advantages. But I would absolutely encourage anybody to do it. And there's all kinds of books and information now on how to do an intervention. And um, it doesn't have to be scary. And um, you also have to be able to risk having your loved one get angry. So mm. what? <laughs> so what? Yeah. So they get angry. The world doesn't come to an end. No. Um. They know that things aren't right anyway, and um, you just can't give up. You really can't. So, I, you know, I guess um, my road in this work began as a result of Charlie's successful treatment. After he had been at Hazleton for several years, uh, I was fortunate enough to be asked to go on the board, and I was the first parent that they'd had on the board. Most of the other folks were in recovery themselves. So as a parent, I brought a very different perspective and I really enjoyed my work there. It's an extraordinary organization. I was very involved in the redevelopment of the youth programs and uh, building some new facilities. Um, and I, because of my experience and because of what I think is going on in our country, I was able to help Hazelden understand that we've really got to focus on youth because if we can get somebody into treatment when they're 17 and 18 and not wait till they're 40 or 50, we have the ability to change their lives. Yeah. You can change somebody's life at any time, but obviously the younger you can get a person into treatment, the better outcome that person's going to have. Right. Uh, and kids start early today. Kids start all this stuff in middle school. And, uh, and uh, they have access. And, you know, it, it was interesting because for us, we had no idea that Charlie was drinking. We, we had some notion about the marijuana, but not the liquor. And we had uh, found out over time that when we when we used to go out of town on weekends and one particular college student that used to come and live with him was giving him alcohol, you know, <laughs> and, wow. and, and, you know, and, and so you just don't know how all of this can begin. You right. really just don't. And I think he gave her out. She gave him alcohol cause she was having her boyfriend over. And so it was sort of their little secret and that's how she, so, so something that innocent and silly can really lead into a terrible problem. So parents uh, and family members need to be aware that these things can start in the most unlikely way. Yeah, in their medicine cabinet. Kids are hmm. taking from their parents and taking their own and sharing with their friends. And Well, yes. I mean, when, when our son was... 18, the Oxycontin problem had just started coming. To, he's 33 now. And it was just starting. A number of his uh, contemporaries were in treatment for Oxycontin addiction. Hmm. Of course, what everybody realizes now is that Oxycontin addiction works like heroin. And so people go to heroin because it's cheaper and it's easier to get. Yeah. And that's the unfortunate truth. So anyway, I served on that board for nine years. I had a fabulous time. I really felt like I made a difference for Hazelden. But when I finished, and during the process, I met Greg Williams, who is the producer uh, and creator of the film The Anonymous People. And he had spoken to our board, and he was a very impressive young man. 
And one of our staff people asked me to meet with him, and I did, and I was very taken with him. And he had this idea to start facing addiction. And so at, from a few conversations, there, there was a small core group of us, Greg and a man named Jim Hood, who um, is a, was worked on Wall Street for many years, but whose son, he lost his son to um, addiction about four or five years ago, and he decided that he was going to do everything in his power to change the course of the addiction world in this country. And so uh, I and a bunch and several other folks agreed to join this board, and the rest, as they say, is history. <laughs> and and so, so facing addiction has really been able to shine a light on the addiction issue in America. And, of course, so many things have been happening in the last year or so around this issue because, to be frank, white middle-class kids are getting addicted to heroin. Now right. this country is paying attention. They didn't pay attention when it was poor people. No. But now they're paying attention because it's not poor people. It's, it's all kinds of people. And that's unfortunate, but it's the facts. And at least now we're we're going to have a bigger imprint. We're going to have a bigger movement, I believe, around solving these addiction problems. So facing addiction is is a membership organization and a general organization. And we hosted a huge event in Washington in October, where we had a very successful concert on the mall. And then on Monday of that weekend, we put 760 advocates on the Hill in Washington. And we have been attempting to grow our membership and to raise funds to do this work. Um, the work that we want to do is we want to let folks in this country understand that addictions are diseases. They're not personal failings. That just like diabetes or is an illness. I mean, nobody chooses to be a diabetic. People don't choose to be addicts. And that we've got to stop the shame and blame. And we've got to expand the uh, uh, treatment that's available across the country. And we've got to do more research into the cures and the potential cures uh, of these illnesses. Uh, we now have antidotes that are well known. But I do believe that during our lifetime, they'll probably be able to figure out a way to stop an addiction before it gets too severe. Really? So, uh, yeah, I do. I think there'll be some kind of implant that you can have or some kind of medication that you can take. Um, there are certainly medications now that make drinking um, ant abuse and those kinds of drugs that make drinking less uh, pleasurable, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think we've we've really conquered yet what what could be um, a way to end end these severe addictions or perhaps curtail them greatly. So those are those are the things that that we're working on and. Uh, as a result of our concert, the Surgeon General was there, the, the, the um, drug czar, Michael Botticelli, was there. And as you may have read and heard recently, the, the, the president has just asked for a billion dollars in his federal budget for addiction treatment. And we do believe that, that our large group in Washington, we had probably 30 or 40,000 at the concert, and the impact that that our name has been making through Dr. Oz and through lots of Huffington Post, New York Times articles, we've had an enormous amount of publicity. So we do believe that we're having an impact. What we need, however, is a lot more money and a lot more members. And we um, we raised in our first year, we raised almost three million dollars. That's great. And it's not enough, but it's great. It's great. It's great, but it isn't enough. 
and it was from a thousand donors. Wow. And so what we need is an outpouring in this country like there is for Stand Up to Cancer or to Farm Aid or to those kinds of... If, if every American in this country would just give a dollar, we could make a huge <laughs> amount of progress. Um, but it's but it's hard to create a national movement. And and that's what we're trying to do. And we do believe that, that this illness is the biggest public health crisis in America. We know that about 22 million people a year are, are addicts. And out of that 22 million, only 10% get the treatment that they need. Yeah. Part of it is because they're afraid or don't know how to ask for treatment. But part of it is also that there simply isn't enough treatment available. And that's a very serious problem. The idea that we put people in prison be because they're addicts and then don't even have 12-step meetings is preposterous. I mean, th there, there are many opportunities where there are large groups of people, particularly people who are incarcerated, that ought to be treated. If they're incarcerated and they happen to have an addiction, they should be getting treated. Absolutely. So, There's a scene that, in uh, The Anonymous People that still haunts me where they were sitting around having a conversation and talking about how if somebody goes in and they say, okay, you know, I'm an addict and I need help, it can be 30 days before there's help available for them and they need help right then versus if they get picked up on the street. I don't know how it is there, but in Arizona – you can have paraphernalia on you and immediately you get your services that you need by going to, or not that you need, but you get services by going to jail. We need to be able to have services available immediately like that for people to. Yes, there ought to be services across the country. And, and there is now a shift. And certainly some of the sheriff's associations have been fabulous and some of the police associations have been fabulous because they're all beginning to understand that this is a health crisis. It's not a behavior crisis. It's a health crisis. I'm glad that shift's happening. It's not happening fast enough, I don't think, but I'm glad that it's happening. Well, true. And, and you know, people were always, you, this country has had a very punitive attitude towards addicts. And so instead of helping them, they, they punish them. And that doesn't solve anything. No. And... You know, if you take somebody and give them 14 days of treatment and then deposit them right back in the same neighborhood that they came from uh, and say good luck, you know what the outcome is going to be. Mm -hmm. So 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 it's uh, it, it's challenging. It's challenging work. But I I believe I, I certainly I and, and Greg and Jim and the other board members really feel like we have a mission um, and that that the timing is such that that facing addiction is exactly what our country needs to do. Mm -hmm. and, and we need to understand that we're all in this together. And you can hardly talk to anybody today that doesn't have a family member that's struggling. I just want to make it or let people know if they want to become a member, they can go to facingaddiction.org and I'll put that in the show notes. I signed up. I think I'm a member. I contributed a few months back and it was before I even knew about Terry or, I mean, this is a dream come true for me to be able to have a conversation with you because I love what you guys are doing and what you're about. But if anybody's interested, you can go to YouTube. There's amazing video of what they did in Washington, um, in October. And one of the things that I really appreciate that you guys give on top of everything else is you let us know what we can do to make a difference with, um, the government. So I've received a few notices recently, like, Hey, here's a link and you just go in here, you can put your information and you make it very simple. And I think that one of the frustrating areas for people like myself is we just don't know what to do. We know there's stuff that needs to be done. We just don't know. So I appreciate what you guys are doing in making that as easy as possible and making it as easy for us to share with other people as possible. Oh, yes. And, and, and I mean, we're, what we're hoping to do in the future is start to have a, a couple of uh, annual call, a couple of calls a year 
for members to, to update them on, on the latest news and the latest research in the industry. But you know, Melissa, what we're really trying to do is create a big umbrella organization like there are for cancer and other diseases. There's an American Heart Association. There's an American Cancer Society. But there's no American Addiction Society. There's no group, big umbrella organization that that says, you know, we're going to all come together and work around this issue. Mm-hmm. And um, so that's what you guys are that, doing. Yeah, and and we hope that you know the member your membership. It you know your your hundred dollars, if that's what it is, is is you know is certainly helping us. And if you can, as I said, if we could turn if we could turn that into thousands and thousands of members, we really could do the work that we need to do, but we need, we need to raise more funds to have staff and, and, and keep the work going. Absolutely. Well, we'll get the word out and get more people. They can watch facing addiction either on the website or if they have Netflix, I think it's on Netflix still, isn't it? Yes, not it is. Addiction. I'm sorry, no, the anonymous people. The anonymous people. Yeah, and it's 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 definitely available on Netflix. And as you mentioned, um, not only can they get lots of information off of YouTube, but we have a Facebook page called Unite to Face Addiction. And I believe between our web, our Facebook page and our website, we have posted some phenomenal audio videos from um, Joe. Joe Walsh and Cheryl Crow and speed and, and the other very wonderful supporter for us has been Dr. Oz. Hmm. We have had numerous shows uh, with our with Jim Hood and Greg Williams, and they just taped another one yesterday. And Dr. Oz spoke at our conference, and he's been wonderful, um, really helping people understand the breadth of this issue. What advice do you have, Terry, for somebody that might be, maybe they just found out that their family member, their child is going through this and they're having a hard time even just getting out of bed or getting through the day. What advice do you have for them? Well, I, I think there's some very good free support organizations that are available um, for parents and siblings of people who have addicts in their family and I, I certainly availed myself of those 12 step groups, um, early on in the process. And it helped me enormously to sort of understand what I could do and what I couldn't do, um, and how I could, I could help my loved one. I think, you know, that many people believe they can help their loved one, um, perhaps in ways that aren't realistic. Um, but one of the things that you really understand is you got to help yourself first. And um, I would also suggest that people do reading. There's plenty of excellent books uh, about uh, fat addictions and their impact on loved ones and families. And there's n- lo- not lots of personal stories that are available. But I think the most important thing is to confront it and uh, to go out and get some help as quickly as you can for yourself and then help to figure out with others what you might be able to do with your your family member. So that's what I would do. I think this has been phenomenal and I really, I'm a huge fan of facing addiction and what you guys are doing. So I'm completely humbled and honored that you would take the time to talk to me and be on the podcast today. Is there anything else that you feel you want to share with the audience or that you want people to know? Yeah, I want you to join. If you're listening, if you're listening to this podcast, and this is a problem that you have confronted in your family, and if you can't afford a hundred dollars, send five, send whatever you can send, and encourage other your your other friends to join as well, and to join us by supporting us. Um, American Cancer Society is over a hundred years old. These things don't happen in five minutes, and and I believe that all of us listening to this podcast and those of us right now will be able to look back on this year as the time when we changed 
attitudes in this country towards addiction. So you can be a proud member of that movement called Facing Addiction. All right. I just want to thank Terry for being on the podcast. You guys stop what you're doing right now. Head over to facingaddiction.org and become a member. You'll be so glad that you did. So in closing, I wanted to share something with you guys. I read um, Jen Sincero's book and it's your uh, bad, in case there's any kiddos listening, how to stop doubting your greatness and start living an awesome life. I'll go ahead and put a link in the show notes to that book if you want to pick that up. If uh, another word for bottom does not offend you. But the reason I'm talking about this is in the back of her book, she has some resources and she talks about loving what is four questions that can change your life by Byron Katie. That book is the book that if you guys remember from episode two, uh, Kevin and Christina were talking about, they said it would change their life. And I just looked it up on audible. So if you want that book for free, you can go to audibletrial.com forward slash addiction support podcast. Once again, I'll put that in the show notes and you can pick up loving what is four questions that can change your life. Uh, This is what Jen has to say about that book. She says, read this book, exclamation point. I demand it. It's the holy grail of being happy in your relationships. Based on what Katie calls the work in uh, parentheses or quotations, which is essentially just asking yourself four simple yet profound questions. This book spends about 10 pages walking you through the steps of the work and a couple hundred on case studies. It's basically like watching Katie perform her magic on all sorts of people, from those who've been brutally raped to people who've lost their children to those who want happier marriages. She walks them through her process and they suddenly find peace and freedom. It's so cool and the work is a piece of cake. So I wanted to share that with you guys. If you want to pick that up for free and support the podcast, you can go ahead and do that on audibletrial.com. And once again, link in the show notes. Love you guys. Leave a review, subscribe. Please share us with any friends that you have that might be going through a situation where this podcast might support them. Thank you. Make it a great week. Encouraging, inspirational, and life-changing content that makes a difference. Created specifically for you by oakcreekwellness.com. Thank you for listening to the Addiction Support Podcast. Addiction support for family and friends from people who've been there. www.addictionsupportpodcast.com.